I want to continue to amplify and signal boost people who are doing great innovations, engineers and scientists and people trying to solve the big problems of the world and communicate all the hope that's going into the people that are trying to change things. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the Create the Future podcast, brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Science, technology, engineering and maths is often shortened to STEM. But there's another acronym becoming popular, which includes art, known as STEAM. And today's guest definitely puts the A into STEM, not only to make plenty of STEAM, but also to explain how it's produced and demonstrate perhaps on TV how it can be used as a powerful force for good, not least encouraging a generation of young engineers. Carrie Byron, best known as one of the presenters on the series Mythbusters, which showcased the enthusiasm and creativity of engineering just about anything for the sake of it. Carrie is also the author of Crash Test Girl and has hosted a range of TV programmes, including Thrill Factor on the science and engineering of roller coaster rides. She's also worked at the special effects company M5 Industries in San Francisco and has been chief creative officer of Smart Girls, a toy company which manufactures self-balancing robots and action dolls and helps girls code. And our conversation began with how she spent her childhood. I was absolutely a maker kid. I was a latchkey kid, which means I came home by myself and babysat myself after school. So I would find anything I could to craft, especially around Halloween time. I used to love to build sets and booby traps that if you'd open a gate, a ghost would come up at you or sewing dolls out of old pantyhose, anything I could find. Basically, my recycling bin was more of a bin of materials. <laughs> more of an opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. And so when you went to further education, this sounds like art was definitely calling you. Art, but specifically three-dimensional art. I love sculpture and I wanted to figure out how I could be an artist, but at the same time still not be a starving artist. And I was fascinated with the monster making movies. Like uh, the, I think it was the making of Thriller that was the first thing that really got me when I saw how they made all those monster faces and how the blood squibs would squirt. And I started watching all the end credit kind of things for like um, the making of Star Wars and anything where they show how they build stuff was so exciting to me. So I, when I went to school for college, they clearly don't have a special effects major. So I ended up kind of making my own major in film studies, art, and strangely enough, minoring in political science. <laughs> yes, that is an interesting combination. Well, you know, I had a fallback. Maybe I could be a lawyer if this like special effects thing didn't turn out. <laughs> and did you go directly from college to M5 Industries as an intern? Oh, goodness, no. When I graduated from college, I took the backpacking route, just seeking out adventure. And it was really even a better education than college was. I think I just, I met so many people doing such interesting things and got such a global perspective. And it kind of dictated how my career is going now, really. So after trying out several different temp jobs while trying to create a resume, that's when a friend of mine told me about M5 Industries and Jamie. So he's one of the original hosts of Mythbusters. Yes, he's he's kind of known for giving everybody their first job in the industry, just like really efficient, quick, dirty, fast builds that were also workable. He was, he just got it done. And I went in and asked if I could work for free. <laughs> and he said, yes. It's a very tempting offer, isn't it? When somebody <laughs> says that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I just wanted to learn. Um, I kind of 
faked my way, fibbed a little bit uh, with my experience on all the tools that were in the shop, but soon learned very, very quickly how to use them. And my first day as an intern was the first day Mythbusters was filming. So it was kind of an accident that I ran into this course. And what sort of things with this sculpting background and you knew you wanted to work in special effects, what particular aspects of the show then did you begin working on? Well, it's kind of an all hands on deck show. So when I started, they hired me as a builder, a background builder. So anything that they came up with, we had to figure out how to build. Sometimes you'd have to even create your own tools because we were building something that didn't exist yet. I would say that the engineering was a little guerrilla engineering because we, we would have to make a face slapping machine. So we had to figure out how to make a quick release system with a rubber hand at the end that would consistently slap us across the face. So we'd all kind of divide up the tasks and I would do something like go make a mold of the hand and figure out how to put that around a metal bar that would not actually injure us when it was slapping us. And, you, you know, of course, the test dummies were generally us. So <laughs> you end up with red cheeks after a little engineering. Because of your practical love of making things and the crafting and the attention to detail, did you find that other aspect of it, of making tools and devising experiments, relatively a sort of natural progression from what you could do anyway? Absolutely. It was just fun. I was just very curious and it was really exciting to come up with ways of doing things. You know, oh, we need to twist wire that can reach all the way across the room. Okay, well, let's put it in a drill and we'll put the drill over here and we'll spin all the wire and make it stronger. And just, you know, coming up with new ways of doing things where it was really exciting and fun. And I think fostering a sense of curiosity, which is what artists do anyway was a really easy transition to science and engineering. Now, it's primarily thought that it helped inspire this generation of engineers and scientists. With your arts background, do you think that it also made people think perhaps with a background that wasn't in science and engineering, oh, that would be really fun to make? Well, I'll be honest with you, nobody on the show had a background in science the closest we had was Grant, who came into the show later, had an electrical engineering background. But the thing that we had in common was that that special effects kind of mentality is just to build things quickly and be very creative. So I think the fact that we all had very creative backgrounds is what made the show work. And it just happens that the scientific method is the perfect narrative vehicle for busting myths. We didn't set out to be an educational show. It was just this amazing byproduct of the show that all of a sudden teachers and parents were contacting us saying that it was being used in classrooms. And that impact didn't really come to until a few years later. And it was very humbling to see the effect the show had because we were just having fun and using science like a tool. So the fact that it inspired people to go into careers in engineering, biotech, science, or even the arts, I, I feel very honored to have been a part of their lives in any special way like that. Which then of the devices taught to you the most and it could be in any area it could be that it taught you never to do it again or or that wow that is so cool and I really enjoy doing that well for one I learned the power of duct tape you <laughs> think that something's being held together with everything you've done but nope and you can just put duct tape around it in the end I, I find that the, <laughs> the most useful tool in the shop Every rig we built was so different and so complicated and so strange that I, I feel like I learned something every day that I went into work, which is why we always looked so excited and inspired because, you know, one day you have to figure out how to create a movie magic decapitating hat that you see in a Kung Fu movie. So you have to see if you can engineer a hat that will fall around someone's head, cut off their head and leave it in a bag. Now, imagine that's your Monday. That is wild, wild stuff. Uh, I used to spend the day just running around looking for different things in the shop that could be 
transformed and kit bashed into something else. Now, not all of those experiments will have worked. Which which are the, the, the ones that you actually did where actually that failure was a huge learning curve? Oh, we had a lot, but one, <laughs> we were trying to bifurcate a boat and we spent days and days and days on a runway trying to split this boat in half. And when we couldn't do it, we thought, okay, just for fun. And we didn't really plan this well. We lifted a boat with a crane high into the air because we were just going to drop it and smash it. And the boat went high up into the air. And then we had a quick release that let go of it. And then the boat came crashing down and all of us were like, yeah, oh no. And then the boat shifted direction and fell right on top of our crane. We're like, oh <laughs> yeah, we should have planned this one out a little for the uh, worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> I also learned during one of those experiments that you can't really arc weld in the rain when it gets too wet because you make a complete circuit and electrocute yourself continually while you're working on your welding project. So lots, lots of life. <laughs> and was this what, you know, having this much fun on this program and sort of going into an area that you perhaps hadn't specifically planned? Is that what really gave you this enthusiasm then for communicating science and engineering and the arts all together, this so-called STEAM aspect? Absolutely. I, I think I just got inspired by what it was doing and wanted to continue on with that because I I just love the effects that it had. I didn't know that I was even going to get into television or, you know, curiosity communications because I was an introvert and pretty shy as a kid. I think people are pretty surprised that this ended up being my career. And I kind of figured out along the way and I still do it. So I feel very fortunate that I tripped and fell into something that actually suits me very well. And I want to continue to amplify and signal boost people who are doing great innovations and figuring out the world's big problems. So um, even my current show, Crash Test World, I run around looking for engineers and scientists and people trying to solve the big problems of the world, keeping the oceans clean, keeping peace in places of great conflict, just anything I can find that people are doing that kind of work. I want to help communicate all the hope that's going into the people that are trying to change things. Did it alter your perception of who engineers were and, and what they do? Or did you sort of have an open mind right from the start? I mean, I think just running around meeting all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds, I don't have a picture of what an engineer looks like. That's good. One of my best friends is an engineer, and it's so funny to see this. She she always felt like when people close their eyes and thought of an engineer, they, you know, they think of some nerdy guy with big glasses and, you know, she's this gorgeous woman who <laughs> decided to actually take up that mantle of showing girls that engineering isn't something that's dominated by men. It's uh, something that they can do too. And she created an entire toy industry around it. I, I'm very inspired by the people that I've met along the way. And with Crash Test World, how's pandemic affected filming? Well, it was a travel show. So <laughs> <laughs> there's there's been a definite shift I would love to get back onto the road, but clearly that's not going to happen for a while. So now um, I've shifted focus a little bit to keep up with what's going on now. And I'm helping launch Explore Media, which is actually creating high production value, short format content with lesson plans so that it can be utilized in classrooms and for remote learning, but uh, very intentionally. Everything from history to math to engineering to even mental health. We are putting together these really amazing, almost Instagrammable lesson plans so that maybe we can take a little load off teachers. We can really create some global citizenry. And my goal is to see more empathy in the next generation. And I think we can do that by using technology in the way that kids use technology and not do it in a condescending way. Like if you want to teach a 12 year old something, talk to them like they're 35. <laughs> want to teach a 35 year old something, you know, talk to them like they're 12. Same goes. 
One of the other things that you've been involved with is a startup called Smart Girls, where you acted as chief creative officer, teaching girls to code. And this was with toys and bringing that whole STEAM aspect together. How did that come about? Well, I always wanted to be a toy maker. That was part of the uh, special effects kind of thing. I'm a sculptor. And so I kind of just cold called this company because they were doing such cool things. Uh, And it was called Smart Girls, where they had these toys that were little scooters that were engineered so cool. The balancing of these scooters with these dolls on them, you could code them through mazes and make them act as you wanted and dance and it was a really cool way of putting play with learning. So I asked if I could be involved with them and, you know, having a daughter just the right age made me, you know, I had a great audience to test out things on. I've noticed something crop up here, which um, I can totally relate to is that you've not waited for opportunities to come your way. You've gone there, you know, you asked, applied to people to be an intern. You said you cold called, smart girls. I mean, this sounds like a very important life skill that I'm often surprised that people don't have, which is don't wait for opportunities to come to you. You sometimes have to go out and knock a lot on a lot of doors. Well, I think it's really scary for people to go in with the idea that someone might say no, and that would create a failure. Like we always had on our hats at Mythbusters, failure is always an option. It's really just a step towards what you want to get to. And I just never felt like the opportunities that come my way, I say yes to everything. And then I try to create whatever I can because I just, I want a very exciting life. And the only way I can do that is by going for it myself. I wrote a book on a dare. Like, it's like, okay, I want to be an author now. I'm going to do this. Like, I I cold call people when I don't know how to do things. I always call an expert. I didn't know how to write a book. So I called a writer and asked for help. I feel like there's people out there in the world that want to help you. And the worst that can happen is that someone says no. And then you're not any worse off than when you started. Well, that's absolutely right. And that was how I was brought up as well. But you're right. Failure, it is really important to know how to to fail. What would you say is the something then that you've not done yet that you really do want to, you know, to do that you've got got in mind? Well, I'm trying to figure out how to do an episode on going to space oh, yes. so that I can catch a ride because I am just fascinated by everything that's going on in both the exploration and commercial uh, space fields. I love asking people who are trying to do this grand idea of getting to Mars or, or creating settlements on the moon. I, I, I just, I want to know how they're doing it and what they're doing and what's the latest technology. And uh, I spent a lot of time (laughs) just calling experts. I got to say, it has nothing to do with uh, what I'm doing. I just, I'm fascinated. So that's why I'm going to try to throw it into some sort of television show. So people will say yes to me. Now, you mentioned your your daughter. How important do you think the role that parents play is towards not allowing sons or daughters to exclude a certain career route? particularly in a very often can be a very gendered world. I can't say I'm a parenting expert in any way, but I do know that when I see people passionate about what they want to do, it makes their kids passionate about it too. So for me, the best thing I could have done for my daughter is go for it myself so that she can see that all opportunities are open to her. And maybe the things that she's interested in don't interest me, but I encourage them heavily because I want to see her happy and excited about what she's doing, whether it's engineering or currently she wants to be a congresswoman when she grows up. I'm going to back her in anything that makes her happy. I think it's very important that we follow, follow our passions, but, you know, include the kids so that they understand that they can do it. And and you've taken what has happened as well in, in, in your past and incorporated it all together in a, in a lovely sort of creative blend and and I believe that you you're still making art and you're you're sort of making art with unusual substances that 
you know, you came across during work. <laughs> Is that right? Yes. Um, I am sitting in my art studio right now and I was inspired by after the explosions on Mythbusters, there would be just this detritus from the blasts and there was just this beautiful chaos to it. And I started to see, I could predict the patterns of how things would work visually through the explosives we used. And I really like black powder. So I started using it as a painting material. It's got a lot of charcoal in it. So it works by, you know, dyeing the paper with the charcoal. I explode charcoal onto paper, generally with areas that are masked off so that it can only explode where I want it to. And sometimes it turns out amazing, sometimes not so much. I have five different kinds of gunpowder and black powder in my cabinet that I can use to make different colors or different techniques. And I've just continued to be a, I, I, don't, I'm, I think it's a thing, a black powder artist for years now. I haven't shown a lot of it other than through the internet, but it's something that I've always loved. And I don't sell it, but I generally do it for fundraising. Excellent. Well, Carrie Bryan, thank you very much for sharing a fascinating career and good luck with your efforts to get into space. I, I wouldn't put it past you to get there. So I shall look out for a program where we see you floating in zero gravity and explaining it as well, no doubt. Oh, absolutely. That would be amazing. Well, thank you. I've had a really good time talking to you. Carrie Byron, thank you for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or visit qeprize.org. Thanks for listening and join me again next time. <laughs>